Our next uh, distinguished guest is Vance Taylor. Mr. Taylor is the Chief of the Office of Access and Functional Needs at the California Governor Office of Emergency Services. Appointed by former Governor Jerry Brown in 2015 and current Governor uh, Gavin Newsom, Vance leads California's effort to integrate his world-class emergency management and homeland security system to meet individuals with disabilities and people with access or functional needs. Uh, Vance is at the forefront of the governor's whole community approach to emergency management and collaborates with local, state, federal partners, nonprofits, and private sector groups. Uh, Vance is also responsible for identifying and integrating the needs of underrepresented population throughout every facet of the emergency management process. Uh, Vance was born in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy as a child and uses a uh, power wheelchair. Uh, he has worked in Washington, DC as an advisor to two different members of Congress, directed security policy at the National Water Association and been a principal at a top ranked Homeland Security and Emergency Management uh, Consulting Firm. Vance is a nationally recognized speaker and advocates for individuals with disabilities. He also has a master's degree in Homeland Security from the University of Connecticut, an undergrad degree from Brigham Young University in Communication. So please join me in welcoming Chief Vance Taylor. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. All right, thanks very much, Bobby, appreciate it. And thanks, Levi and Director Lightborn. Certainly appreciate your remarks. Uh, very helpful, great info to have. But, you know, I, I think uh, I want to start just a little bit by giving my own background. Uh, so, as Bobby said, I'm a California native. I was uh, born in Santa Rosa. I spent a few years in Sonoma County. When I moved up north uh, to Humboldt County, and then ended up back in Sonoma County. Um, along the way, I was diagnosed, as was my sister, with muscular dystrophy. And so I spent the majority of my life uh, using a power wheelchair, which was giving me, obviously, a, a, a different perspective. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that perspective today and, and in, in the work that we're all, I think, individually and collectively trying to do. Um, I grew up and I was told, hey, and this was really by my mom, uh, who raised us, I was raised in a single parent household, hey, you can do great things. Right? You can work. Uh, you can go to college, you can have a family, you can do anything that, that you want to do. Those opportunities exist. And at the time, I really felt like, uh, you know, I wanted to believe her because I wanted those things to be true. But the reality was, I couldn't see people like me doing those things. I didn't know anybody who had a disability, who had gone to college, or who had, had professional success. I didn't know husbands and fathers who fulfilled their roles sitting in a wheelchair. And so it was this hope that what she was saying was true. And so I pushed. And when I graduated uh, at 17, I took the plunge and I moved out of state to go to college, uh, which turned out to be an, an incredible experience. Uh, like most college experiences, I think you could say it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. 
uh, depending on the day, but overall, just a wonderful experience. I remember having worked really hard trying to ensure that I could use that university experience as a springboard to be able to attain professional success. And I remember recruiters came to college my senior year and I applied for a position out of 200 applicants. They said they gave 20 interviews. I was one of the individuals selected for an interview. I remember being in the hallway with the other applicants, all of us being very nervous. And the interviewer came out and said, Van Taylor? I said, that's me. And the applicant uh, that the interviewer was expecting to see was obviously not where I was. And he said, uh, Wait, wait, no, I meant Van Taylor. I said, yeah, it's not a common name. I'm the only one. That's me. And he kept looking at the resume and looking at me and looking at the resume and looking at me. And it was clear that he didn't understand how you could have this great academic resume and these other achievements that I'd had in college and yet do those things from a wheelchair. And so right away, I thought, well, I got to win this guy over. And so I tried to be funny and make him laugh and put him at ease. And in the course of the interview, he asked several inappropriate questions about my disability, about how I get ready in the morning, about transportation, about uh, things that you're, you're not supposed to be asking. In fact, they legal to ask. And yet there I was understanding that this was the gatekeeper between all that I wanted in life at that time um, or that feeling of, boy, I worked so hard for nothing. And so even though I knew it was wrong to ask to be asked those questions, but I answered them. And I went on as best I could. And at the, inter at the end of the interview, he said, uh, I want you to know I was really surprised when I saw you had a disability. And I was, oh, really? I didn't even notice, but I played it so cool, you know. And he said, uh, I think you're perfect for this job. But I have concerns that because of your disability, you won't be able to do it. And so, you know, thanks, but uh, we're going to go another way. And I remember thinking, you know, this is not a construction job that I was applying for. It was as a financial analyst, right? I didn't have to lift big bags of concrete. I had to calculate numbers and be good with people. Two things that I excelled at. And I ended up feeling like being contracted. I remember calling my mom and just saying, you know, it was a lot, right? I was told that if I work hard, that if I push, that I can achieve my dreams. And yet, I did everything I was supposed to and just because I'm in a wheelchair, that was taken from me. And I sat in that feeling for a little bit. And then I remember having this moment of clarity, right? This, this understanding that I couldn't let somebody else take away my dreams. And so I decided that what I would do is I'd work even harder so that I became so ridiculously over qualified for whatever job I wanted that there would be no way that I could be denied work again. And I enrolled in a master's program 
Uh, there was an MBA program. After a year, I decided to take some time off to get some work experience. Uh, I did what now seems like a crazy thing. I flew 3,000 miles across the country to Washington, D.C., where I knew zero people. And I interned uh, for a member of Congress. And it was an unpaid internship. It was supposed to last for three months. And that's only because I only had enough money to stay out there for three months. Uh, I remember feeling that weight on my shoulders, knowing that I had to prove that I could work as hard. But because of my disability, there would be those who looked at me and didn't believe that I could achieve the same as that. There might even be some who were there who saw my disability and assumed that that's how I'd gotten the opportunity. And so the interns would usually come in from uh, 10 to 3, I think it was, or 10 to 4. And I showed up at 8 o'clock every day. And I never left before 6. And I remember the, the staff in the office would say, hey, you don't have to, you don't have to work these crazy hours, you know. I would say, well, you work those hours. I'm a part of this team. And so a month and a half in, uh, there was an opening, uh, opening for a, a staff member there. And out of all the interns, guess which one they offered the job to? Right? It was me. And it was that sense of if you work hard enough, if you push hard enough, that you really can do these things. And I remember... I was going down the hall out of the Cannon House office building and I turned around a corner and I literally ran into a gentleman in a wheelchair. Our chairs literally collided. Uh, and it turns out that he was a congressman from Rhode Island the only member of the House of Representatives that used the wheelchair. His name was Tim Langevin. And Jim asked, well, hey, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Uh, I told him, I just got a job here, you know. He said, I want you to come see me. And so he, he talked to this guy once and said, get him in here. And I went, and he talked to me about what it was like to be the only person in Congress using a power chair. And he talked about what it was like to not be able to see others like him trying to do those things and succeed the way he was trying to succeed. And when things got hard for me, I remember thinking, you know, Jim can do it. I can do it. And a lot of times I'd give me a boost I needed. Now, I blinked, and 13 years passed. And in those 13 years, uh, I met the love of my life. We got married. We had two children. I'd got a master's in Homeland Security. I'd worked for two different members of Congress. I led security policy at the National Trade Association. And I became a partner at a ranked Homeland Security and Emergency Management Consulting Firm. And we felt like, our family felt like, we were happy. We were doing good work. We loved our house. Kids loved their school. And then I got a phone call. In California, and the governor was looking to appoint someone as 
chief of the office of access and functional needs. Because the governor said, but we understand as a state that there are inequities in the way disasters impact different populations. There was an understanding that whenever something bad happens, whether it's a fire or flood, pandemic, that the individuals who are hit the hardest are people with disabilities, older adults, anyone with an access or functional need. And so the offer was made, come to California and serve in this capacity. And I said, I'll only do it if I know that you're serious. If this is window dressing, I'm not going to take a pay cut and move 3,000 miles and have my family leave everything they know. And I was assured this was real. So I came out. And uh, a month in, we responded to the third and fifth worst fires in state history. And I saw firsthand what it was like to go to a shelter and not have that shelter be accessible. And I saw with my own eyes what it was like to have people who needed accessible resources like showers and they didn't have them. And I saw the pain and the despair that comes as a consequence of those of those gaps. And in doing my work, I realized very quickly that nobody was trying to be exclusive. Nobody was trying to create a gap. Nobody wanted to marginalize entire populations or members of the community. But what happened was that the people that were making these plans Salt of the earth folks, oftentimes were former military or police officers or first responder types who never had a lived experience with an access or functional need. And so they came at things from their own lived perspective, which is very different from the perspective of someone who has that lived experience. When I go into a room, I'm automatically looking for access. Are there stairs? Is there a ramp? Are the aisles cluttered? Can I get around? Can I fit under a table? If you don't use a wheelchair, chances are you're not looking for any of those things. And that's okay. It's not good or bad. But what it tells you is that in order to create a situation that works for everyone, we have to have a variety of perspectives at the planning table. And in emergency management, that means that the way we plan, prepare, respond, and recover has to be more inclusive. And so I think about a few things, uh, particularly as it relates to this group. One is, I still feel that weight on my shoulders as I look around and realize that for many individuals, you know, look, a lot of times I, I, I'm, the, I'm the only guy in the room, right? I'm, I'm that, that Sesame Street song. Uh, you know, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, the majority of the meetings I go to, I'm the only person there a physical disability that, that is seen. Um, and I realize there's a few things that are one is uh, we've got good people that want to do great things. And so I get to work with them and partner with them and share my perspective. And they want to know it, they want to hear it, they want to understand it. 
And then together we start to integrate the way that we provide services in the state. The other thing it does is it allows for me to serve as the example for others that I never had. And I think that you can't underestimate the power of representation and example of just seeing people that are like you. You know, we had the inauguration yesterday and my family were all hunkered down at home as our I think everyone on this call, uh, which gave us an opportunity to watch inauguration together. And all politics aside, the power, I should say the empowerment that took place in being able to show my two girls the first female vice president of the United States was powerful, right? They see someone of color, they see a woman, and without me having to say anything, they, even at a, almost a subconscious level, now know that those things are possible. Not just because I've told them they can achieve whatever they want, but because they can see someone who has achieved those things. So when you get to work, uh, you know, let's think about that. Let's look around and see who's here and who's not here. And if what we're finding is that there's a dearth of individuals with disabilities, then we need to think about the way that we recruit our talent, the way that we interview people, the way that we hire and retain, and of course promote people with disabilities. Um, I've never accepted when I hear somebody say, well, the reason why we don't have more employees with disabilities is because we can't find talented or capable applicants with disabilities. I refuse to believe that. Um, if we're not finding applicants with disabilities who are qualified in large enough numbers, it's because we're not recruiting right. It could be because what we're putting in the job descriptions or requirements the duty statements um, are making those individuals feel excluded from the process. Like on our on one of our duty statements, it says you have to be able to lift. I think it's like fifty pounds. Well, we have a lot of jobs at our agency that you would never have to lift fifty pounds, right? But if I were just to read that, I would think, well, I guess I can't apply to that. Um, so, you know, let's, let's think about those things. Um, Levi, you were talking about reasonable accommodations. Let's remember that it's a hard thing for me to go and ask you for a reasonable accommodation. But there's stress and worry and vulnerability associated with that. But I'm telling you, I can't do something, and I'm scared that if you and I can't figure something out, maybe I won't be able to keep my job. Or I'm scared that somebody else is going to find out and think I'm getting special treatment. Um, you know, so let's just keep that in mind as we go through as well. Um, I'm preaching to the choir, I know. I think as we go through and we, we integrate our workforce, as we recruit, hire, retain, and promote people with disabilities, as we integrate 
the products that we develop, which at Cal OES are life-saving products, right? Emergency operation plans, shelter operations, all these things. Um, let's do so with a level of understanding and empathy and compassion. And I, and I think let's be proactive because it's the responsibility of those who are in power, if you will, to reach out and extend themselves, to reach out and lift others. Right? So many times we think it's, it's the other way around. Um, but while we all have to do our part, we all need opportunities as well. Uh, you know, I'll close just by saying that whether we're talking about emergency management, COVID and all these things, or whether we're talking about providing reasonable accommodations, or whether we're talking about having broader and greater representation in our workforces, everyone on this meeting has a role to play. Each individual that's on the Zoom meeting right now has an opportunity to be the right person at the right time in the lives of our colleagues and future colleagues. I think back so many times, what if I had never rounded that corner and bumped into Jim Rangovin? What if I had lost the opportunity to have him as a mentor? When the hard times came and I had no one to think of, would I have been able to get through? I don't know. That's a tough question to answer. We get to play that role in the lives of other people. We get to be a trusted partner and friend. We get to be a trusted colleague. We get to be the one to help someone feel welcome and accepted. And to take people who have been marginalized and let them know you belong. And that, to me, is a privilege. And it's an honor. So you lift, and I'll lift, and together we'll all ascend. Thank you. Thank you, Vance. That was, uh, that was just terrific presentation. You articulated many of the concerns faced by many of our folks that are in the audience today. So thank you for sharing that. Do you have a few minutes to uh, take some Q&As? Yeah, happy to. Great. Uh, Susan? Yes, I will get started. Um, we have uh, a question about, um, have you written a book or have you written anything that we can read about your life and your experiences? Do you have anything published or available? Um, not published. I'm nothing published. Vance, do you have any advice? Um, because as someone who's considers herself an activist and a, and an advocate. Um, I'm often concerned about making uh, people that I'm, you know, speaking to feel uncomfortable, like I'm attacking them or that they're feeling criticized by showing new perspectives, by trying to kind of open their brain a little bit. Um, do you have any advice about how you handle it? I mean, I notice you're a storyteller, so I'm assuming that's some of it, but do you have any one-on-one -on -one advice? Yeah, it, you know, I, I really feel like, uh, first off, overall, I think people are good. But that's just my own kind of feeling and philosophy. Um, and because of that, uh, I, I think that they can feel your sincerity. And so there's a difference to me between identifying a gap, right, stating a need, Kind of talking about say this is the the current landscape. Um, I think you can do that without 
attacking or being overly aggressive. Um, I think that it's also important to recognize, and I certainly do, when I talk about these things, that it's really easy, I think, for people to feel like uh, they're being criticized. Right, which is why I'm I'm really quick to say things like, uh, you know, you've got these salt of the earth people. I was talking about emergency managers who just had a different perspective, right? That they were coming up with the best plans they could, uh, but because they didn't have a broader perspective, the plans they developed had gaps. And then outlining the value of having more perspectives at the table and as a part of that process. Um, to me, that states that there are gaps, right? That there are there's an issue. That we have to be broader. We have to partner. We have to do outreach. But it's different than me saying something critical of the individuals who are doing the planning right now. Because I think that, again, as I said, good people trying to do good things. Um, so I, I think just kind of separating, here's what the problem is, or what the gap is, from a statement about an individual is really important. And then I always feel like we get further with partnership. Right? It can't be your plan. It can't be my plan. It has to be it's our plan. It's got to be our plan, right? Thank you so much. Do we have anybody else that wants to ask Avance a question? Uh, yes, I do. Hi there. I'm Tracy Threlfall with Prison Industry Authority, and I want to thank you for a fantastic uh, talk today. Um, one of my takeaways uh, that I got from this was uh, rejection is the universe's protection. Because had you gotten that job that you wanted, the one where they made you feel so terrible, where would you be today? And so that was a very inspiring, as it's saying in the chat. Um, you mentioned outreach and recruitment. And do you have any suggestions on how we can uh, do a better job of that in reaching? Are there certain agencies or um, things that you would suggest putting in the duty statements that would create a more inclusive environment specifically? Yeah, so I think that there's a, a couple of things, and thank you. Um, I uh, appreciate your comment. That was very kind. Um, so I think when we talk about recruiting, um, let me just tell you, like from the emergency management perspective, we try and get emergency information out to the community, right? We want people to know what's a disaster, what should they do, where should they go, but we want them to be informed. What we found is we're far more effective when we partner with the community-based organizations that serve the individual populations we're trying to reach out to. And so if we partner, let's say, with uh, the Council for Developmental Disabilities or CFLC, right, Foundation for Independent Living Centers, and we provide them with emergency information that they then push out through their networks, we find that water then gets to the end of the row. Not only does information get in the hands of people who want, um, but they receive it from a trusted source. And so, Somebody might get something like, hey, Vance Taylor, who's that, right? Cal OS, I don't know. But if they get it from a community-based organization that they know and trust, then they're much more likely to do something with it. So on the recruitment side, I think we do a great job of posting on Cal HR, but do we reach out to community-based organizations and other agencies that specifically work serve and provide resources for people with disabilities because we can and through that partnership more people with disabilities will become aware 
are the opportunities in state government that exist for them. Um, so recruitment was part of your question. What was the, what was the other half of your question? Duty yeah, statements. statements. Yeah. One of the things that, that I think is interesting is, uh, you know, I think we can all say that we don't, we don't always review the duty statements as regularly as we probably should. Right. Um, and so I think just setting up a regular review and including in that review either individuals at your agency with disabilities, um, using the DAX, and or using, again, trusted uh, partners from the community uh, to, to look at that, to have more eyes on it, I think is, is really important. And it's one of those things where it's it's really important to remind people, hey, we're looking for feedback and input and recommendations. And then we'll take that and we, we have a process to work through for it. But not that, uh, that you're driving the train, right? Uh, so I, you don't ever want somebody to feel like, okay, well, I'm writing all the, but the, the new duty statement, right? Again, it doesn't work that way. These things are collaborative and we have a respective process, but we want to have more perspectives as a part of that process. Thank you. It's very helpful. And we have one more question in the comments um, from Tina. Are you a motivational speaker, Vance? Uh, well, I'll leave it to you to, to tell me if I'm motivational or not, but I... I, I do um, a fair amount of speaking, and uh, I've done that for many years. Uh, there was a, a time where that was basically what I did was go to different groups and conferences and organizations, and I would speak, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I could travel a lot, and you know, right now it's kind of fun because. I can do it all on Zoom, right? So uh, I can go to three different places today on Zoom. During non-COVID times, I spent a lot of time going up and down the state talking about these issues, particularly on the emergency management side. But yeah, happy to talk to any of your groups or organizations uh, or partner with you in any way we can. I wanted to add, Tina, also, and that you know, this kind of amplifies our sentiment about your presentation today, what Tina had stated. Tina said, Vance, you're really inspiring. I like that you are constantly helping people understand and empathize with people with any sort of disability. However, you are strong, powerful, and have no excuses and that you're even not afraid of getting special treatment. You're such a role model. And then she asked the question, are you a motivational speaker? And to add to that, I would say I'm inspired, I'm odd. I am certainly moved. So I would certainly consider you to be a motivational speaker and inspiration for all. Thanks, Bobby. Really appreciate it. Hi, Vince. This is Eduardo. I, um, so you had mentioned what a big step forward it is to we have um, the first woman uh, vice president and it's all you know also it is a woman of of color and you know that is i think very very important but i kind of wish that eventually we'll have disability representation in the white house so this is our you know our first um i'm just throwing this out there our first um blind president i, I don't know i kind of wish that one day one day we'll get there. So, so that's just my my take on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that uh, that I always feel like is going to be great when we get to a point where uh, we don't have to keep having first, right? But uh, yes. But things like color and, and uh, ethnicity and uh, you know gender orientation, or identification, all these things, you know, I think the sooner we get to where we just have a broader representation, uh, 
the, the better we're all going to be and the better for it. I'm excited about that uh, mm-hmm. present with this ability, though, because then I think we'll have uh, even more ramps everywhere. <laughs> and, and, and what I want to add to Eduardo's comment is that we did have presidents that were in wheelchairs, but they hid their disability instead of showing it to the world. And hopefully someday that uh, line is going to be invisible, that uh, we're not going to be afraid to show any kind of disability, mental or otherwise. So we look forward to that day. But I do have another question for you, uh, Vance. Uh, I know COVID-19 had presented certain amount of challenges to the community of uh, you know, access and functional needs people. Uh, during last year, we had a lot of wildfires. Add to that, we had COVID-19. It's challenging enough to house and shelter people uh, when they are the victim of the wildfires. How did you handle or your agency handle uh, housing and uh, sheltering people, the wildfire victims during this COVID-19 who also needed the access and functional needs? Yeah, so it's a great question. And it's one of the things we're really concerned about. Uh, you know, obviously, because of COVID, we moved away from congregate sheltering. We didn't want to put lots of people in a confined space. And so we moved to what we called non-congregate sheltering, mm-hmm. uh, which really just meant we're moving to hotels and motels, uh, and in some cases, even university dormitories. Now, at first blush, you think, oh, that's great, right? I'd rather be in a hotel than in a, a, a shelter somewhere, right? Uh, but you have to take a step back for a minute. Let's think. Uh, a hotel is great if you have transportation and you can get to and from a store and you have resources to buy groceries and food. And you can prepare that food by yourself. Um, and if you have that transportation to get to and from work or medical appointments or anywhere else you need to go. But if you don't, then essentially what a hotel does is it stands you somewhere. And without providing those meals, like when you go to a shelter, there's three meals a day and there's snacks everywhere. And it's easy for people to access. And if somebody's not eating, um, then, you know, one of the shelter uh, volunteers, it's really easy for them to see, oh, well, that person hasn't, hasn't eaten all day. Let's ask or check in if they're okay. But in a non-congregate sheltering environment, you don't have eyes on people. And so it was challenging because what we had to do was find a way to ensure that, one, we knew where people were. Um, and, And two, that we were able to provide daily wellness checks because just because somebody's fine today doesn't mean that they're going to be okay in two days. Um, and we wanted to make sure also that as a part of those wellness checks, we weren't just asking about, um, do you have what you need, you know, terrible medical equipment or otherwise, but that we were also asking questions like, uh, when's the last time you ate? And so it would happen uh, as we started going through this process. But you can imagine on the front end, uh, there were a lot of gaps, right? Trying to figure something out in real time uh, is is not uh, easy, uh, especially when you've got COVID, which impacted all 40 million Californians at the same time. And at one point, we had 28 major declared wildfires burning at the same time up and down the state. And so trying to figure this all out uh, was a challenge. And so it would happen to where we'd get a phone call and find out there's a group of people at this hotel and they haven't eaten in two days. Um, and 
thankfully we work with Red Cross, we work with local government, we work with our community-based organizations, we work with all the partners and resources we had access to, and we were able to develop a system to where people would go to one central spot to be assigned essentially a hotel, and we'd have their info, we'd know where they were, and we could track and follow through to make sure they were getting what they needed. Uh, like all operations, it wasn't perfect, but it was certainly much improved and, and much more refined. Uh, and we feel much better about moving forward. Well, uh, for you know, whatever reason, if we're going to have to use a, a non-congregate setting again, that we've not got a system and a model in place. But uh, yeah, it was a tremendous concern. Um, we want people to be healthy and safe and secure. And we also want for them to be able to maintain their independence. And those services and resources need to be provided in a way that enables them to maintain their dignity as well. Um, so that, that's what we strive for. Thank you, uh, Vance. I uh, really appreciate the response. Uh, you have been very generous with your time. It's been outstanding presentations. So I wanna thank you on behalf of SDAC. Uh, we may have some additional questions that may come through our chat directly. Would it be okay if we forward it to you for a response at a later time? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining SDAC. It's been fantastic.